Hey everyone, this is Nitro. In this video, I thought I would go over in detail the final party I used for Apex Season 1 and the gear that they had. Now, there's these 15 characters that you see here. And in addition to these 15, I had also used Elwyn occasionally, although not in the finals. And I also used Chloe. So I'm pretty much going to go over all of these characters one by one so you can kind of see how they were built up in total. So let's start with the characters that are currently out of the party and I'll begin with Chloe. Now keep in mind in the case of Chloe, she didn't really bring her equipment set, the current one on her for the final battle. I think what I did was I replaced the green leaf coat in Sage's hat with Tiaris's, uh Tenyo's uh, death robe and Tenyo's headdress because I felt that having the Tenyo's headdress was more important than the Sage's hat buff and they also gave similar amount of hit point increases. For example, the death robe had the 9% here along with 8% plus 10% here. So that's 18% plus 9% which is 27% hit point increase, right? And in the case of her current gear, it's a mere 10% increase and 10% for 20%. So I did replace these two pieces. But she did keep her Gift of Eternal Life and her. I think she kept her True Cross as well. So basically, that was pretty much my Chloe setup. Um, the main goal was to try to increase her hit points as much as possible so that she can survive. And she was more here to use Aurora Ring than do damage anyways. right? She did run pretty much the skills you see here, Aurora Ring, Discipline, and the Heal skill. But I should also mention, ultimately my Chloe's intelligence was not very high, uh, so she wasn't a very good attacker in general. I really just spent more time using Aurora Ring and casting Heal than Discipline with her. So that was my Chloe, who I brought in for just really one battle. She did have double class mastery, and in terms of her bonds, they're still quite lacking. Six. <laughs> it's 61% and in fact I forgot to even unlock her toughness bond <laughs> for the fights. So she was max 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 0, 5 and a heart bond of level 2. Not very upgraded as you can see. So that was my Chloe. It is what it is. She was used for my I think my second battle in the Apex Arena matches and her Aurora Ring definitely made a difference in the match against... Wow, <laughs> sorry. In the match against Cliff Elbrig. So, next. After Chloe, who I didn't really need to go over gear in detail, uh, I will start with Varna. So Varna was also a character that was truly not complete because you can see her in terms of enchant, she had two full moon enchants and then two rough sea enchants, which is already kind of awkward. In addition, the Devil's Axe had a 13% attack increase, while the Gargoyle Jacket had a 10% hit point increase with 4% attack increase. So you can see why I didn't really want to reroll the enchant on this one in particular. And since I didn't want to reroll the enchant on this one, I didn't reroll the enchant on the Devil's Axe. It just didn't make sense to have, let's say, three full moon enchants and then one rough sea. So it was a broken set, and the Jorman Gendir's Eye had an 11% hit point increase to try to max out her survivability, while the Winged Shin Guards just had a 10% attack increase. So pretty much a reasonable attack increase with some hit point increases, right? You can see that there's the 11% here with 10%, so that's 21% hit point increase, which is solid. Of course, despite that, my Varna was still very, very susceptible to AoE attacks. I think she died to a Dark Demise attack, right? So ultimately, it was not enough hit points on my Varna. In terms of her bonds, this Varna is 6 stars, as you can see here, and her bonds were actually basically maxed out. Max, 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 8 on the toughness bond, 9 on the strength bond, and a max heart bond. So even with all these upgrades, she didn't have enough hit points. Um, 
clearly, in order for my Varna to be tankier, I would have really needed to have a last rights on her. But I only have one, so it wasn't gonna go on to my Varna, unfortunately. So this one. So that is my Varna. Not really, not really complete, but solid. So after Varna is Iris, and Iris is also a character that was kind of in a transitional build state. So she did. So my goal was like Varna, pretty much, maximum hit points. So to that end, I actually had two pieces of gear with a Tree of Life enchant because two greens gives a 10% hit point increase. Right. There was a 7% hit point increase, maximum of 10% on the Crystal Ball, and then also a 11% hit point increase on the Sage's Hat. So in total, this was offering an 18% hit point increase with another 10% for 28% hit point increase. You know, better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Preferably, you would have you know Tenyo's robe, Tenyo's headdress for the 20% right there in SSRs, but I don't think anyone has that many Tenyo's robe and headdresses at this time. In terms of her armor, she has a Baldur's white robe, and the only reason she has one is because I had no, I don't have a Tenyo's robe for her. It's just that simple. So that's the only reason I gave her this Baldur's white robe. And then finally, her blue moon has a 14% int increase. So you can see that she has a good amount of intelligence for good healing with her lovely heart talent as well as with Dolly and using her regular heal. But the main goal was try to increase her survivability a bit and what really helped was especially having the Bolt Rangers which help, which have a 100% chance to decrease damage taken by 50% before entering battle. Next, so after Iris we move to Liana. I've already covered Liana previously, so I think I'm just going to breeze through her. But the key, interesting thing here is my Liana Shrine Maidens are actually only level 9. They're not level 10. Uh, it's because I don't have enough resources to upgrade them to level 10. That's the first aspect of it. And the second aspect is that they didn't need to be at level 10. The 70% damage reduction is has already been enough to make my Liana ridiculously tanky. Um, bond wise, Lea actually I should talk about Iris's bonds first, shouldn't I? Iris's bonds are not complete, 80%, so it's max 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 on the first three, level 9 on the toughness bond, level 6 on the strength bond, and then level 3 on the heart bond. Leanna's bonds are also not complete, although they're a bit better than Iris, max max max, level 7 toughness, level 8 strength, and level 6 heart bond but both of them could use completion, for sure. Next, uh, in terms of Liana's gear, she does have the optimal, I guess, mage and healer type of gear in that she, both of her gear are SSRs that offer 10% hit point increase, right? So in total, because of that, she has 19% here, Another 19% here, so that's 38% hit point increase. 38 hit point increase plus 7, 45% hit point increase. 45% plus another 7 is a 52% hit point increase in total from her gear. So that's why my Liana was so shockingly tanky. Next, so after Liana, we're going to move into Imelda. Imelda. With her gorgeous red exclusive helm, she allows allies within two blocks of her to be immune to fixed damage. So, I gave her a meditation ring so that she herself is also immune to fixed damage. Now, this is pretty much a forced item. I, I was accepting the fact that my Imelda would then be very vulnerable to getting silenced, but it's something I had to take. Right. Unless you have that many, let's say, swordsmith medals or bracer emblems that you can equip on her, in which case you can equip one and be immune to fixed damage and effects that silence active skills. And that would be the ideal piece of equipment for your for Imelda if you can get it. It'll reduce her intelligence, right? Because you won't get an intelligence increase from the piece of gear. But 
that immunity to silence and uh, fixed damage will be key. So, other than those two pieces of gear, she does have a Galaxy Cloak. And the reason for the Galaxy Cloak is, once again, I don't have a Tenuous Robe for her. But this Galaxy Cloak got a ridiculously good enchant. It's a Breeze enchant with 14% hit point increase and a 4% int increase. Right? Given this can only max out at 15% and this can max out at 5%, this is a near perfect enchant. Right? So comboed with the 5% hit points here, this is a 19% hit point increase. Gorgas Red could use a better enchant, right? but it does provide the hit point and int for now. I would really want to reroll this. No, probably not aiming for a 14 fourth kind of thing, but maybe like a 10 30 or something similar. And finally, for her weapon, she is currently using a Purgatory because I had one at level 50. <laughs> it's that simple. It has a 7% hit point increase with 10% int. You know? Once again, for my healers, I generally focus on hit points over pure int. And it worked out quite well in making my Imelda reasonably tough. You know? it was, this was a little bit lacking in that Leon was able to one-shot her with a melee attack when he didn't have chivalry up, right? So there was that situation, but I think that is linked more to her wizards than anything else, right? The fact that she has no soldier that can decrease damage taken means that ultimately Imelda is overall very vulnerable to what getting one-shotted. And the other factor is my Imelda is actually just five stars. It's not six stars. Next, Tiaris. Oh, sorry, Imelda's bonds. In terms of bonding, Imelda is near completion as well. The regular bonds are all maxed out, at least as maxed out as it can be at this time. Her heart bond is stuck at level 8, so I needed two more upgrades to bring her to level 10. Didn't bother because A, I lacked the resources, and B, I didn't think this slight boost was enough to make my Imelda tanky enough anyways, so I just left it at that for now. But Season 2, if I continue to use Imelda, she will be fully upgraded. Alright, continuing on. So after Imelda is Tiaris. And Tiaris, another character who doesn't have perfect gear yet, right? because she needs a Tenuous Robe. I think I've already covered Tiaris before, but uh, in any case, she does have a Goddess's Left Hand here with a 15% increase and 74 hit point increase. And I'm very happy with that, in large part because Tiaris is ultimately more focused on healing than most of my other characters. Um, the Death's Robe is Waiting Replacement with something that gives plus 10% hit points. So this is a temporary measure. The Tenyo's headdress does provide the 10% hit point increase. Currently, it could use a better roll with because it's only 8% with 3%. So once again, you know, I may have to re-roll enchants on this steadily until I get something like 15% with an int increase or something similar. And finally, her holy ring currently was focused more on int with 7% int increase with 10 int and 43 hit points. This this is a situation where this happened because I didn't have enough full moon enchant scrolls. Yeah. I really did want to enchant my Tiaris similar to Liana, right? With primary focus on hit points rather than intelligence. But lack of enchant scrolls, especially with the season ending, didn't leave me enough full moon scrolls to roll for perfect enchants for my Tiaris, which made her ultimately very vulnerable in multiple matches. Uh, I know Tiaris has died for me multiple times to AoE attacks, and that's just simply because of a combination of not enough hit points in hit point increases in her enchants, and not enough hit point increases in her gear. So that's my current Tiaris. Zerida! Zerida with a breeze enchant was surprisingly tanky, especially since she had less rights, right? Um her King's Crown has a near-perfect enchant, right? 4% attack, 11% hit points. It's very hard to roll something better than this. But the last strikes could use a reroll because there's no attack increase on it. The Overlord's Badge 
had 10% attack and that's more than good enough for me. I'm not going to try to reroll this for 10% attack and hit point increase. At least not until much later in the future. And finally, the bloody melody that she currently has has a 15% attack increase. Ideally for the weapon, you really want something like 14 or 15% attack with a plus attack stat. But that needs a lot of rolls and I just haven't had luck in that sense. After Zerida's and Tiaris's bonds are both basically maxed out. So bringing that up, Tiaris, you can see it's near the top, 90%. Her only bond that's not maxed out is her int bond in truth, increasing her intelligence. So in terms of survivability, she was maxed out. And that's what I prioritized on Tiaris. Zerida, on the other hand, I prioritized on attack because I didn't feel 4% more hit points would allow her to survive in general. Her survivability came from being at full hit points and last rights kicking in. Plus, I didn't fully max out her toughness bond, which meant max, max, max. 9 on the strength bond, max on the heart bond for the 5% all stats, but no max on the toughness bond. After Zerida is Leonhard. My Leonhard, first of all, is 5 stars, not 6 stars. But. Despite that, his power level was 59.33, and for his gear, I focused on maximum attack. So you can see 11% attack with 20 attack here. That's higher than 15%. I actually ran the magic enchant on him, which I kind of regret. Uh, the reason I ran magic enchant was because, simply though, because I had the scrolls. Um, even now, I think I have magic enchant scrolls, which while I don't really have any SSR scrolls of anything else. You see. Yeah, so there's 33 magic enchant scrolls, 31 rough sea scrolls, you know. There's no tree of life scrolls, no full moon scrolls, and so on. So I think ultimately that's why I ended up running no breeze scrolls. So ultimately that's why I ended up running the magic enchant on Leonhard. Because I had the scrolls. You know. People who let's say purchase every day the enchant packs, right? They would be able to choose enchants at will. In my case, I made do with what I had access to. So, in terms of his enchant values then, Leonhard had the very high attack blood sword hunting. He had a mirror armor with basically a little bit over 5% attack. He also had an Aeneas' helmet with 3% attack and 5% hit points. And finally, he had a Slayer's emblem with 7% attack. So you can see, could have used improvement on a bunch of these, but I, you know what, it was good enough overall, and I settled for that. And frankly speaking, it was so rare for me to be actually to actually be able to deploy Leonhard that this worked out fine. Generally, people banned my Leonhard in the list cell. At the very least, my Leonhard was a big enough threat that people would always ban him. And in terms of bonds, he was maxed out, except for the toughness bond, which was missing one less upgrade. So max, 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 8, 9, and max heart bond. I never had my Leonhard get one-shotted, so yeah, it worked out. So after Leonhard, the next character to cover will be Bernhard, bread and butter. He was my tank in quite a few matches, including in the finals. First weakness of my Bernhard is he's only five stars, not six stars. He's one of the characters I'm looking at bringing up to six stars and it will happen, but I need time, you know. In fact, I should mention all of my tanks, Bernhard, Landius, and Juggler are all at five stars. Right. I just don't have the number of shards to farm them up to 6 stars. So, in terms of survivability though, Bernhard with the Lava Titans was quite strong. My Lava Titans, I should also mention, weren't actually at level 10. Um, their burn damage was only 22%, which definitely hurt me in several matches, I think, because 
at level 10, the burn damage is actually 30%. So my lava titans are actually quite low level, level 7, but they worked. Yeah. They did what they needed to do, and it was enough to win me matches, so I have no complaints about that. His bonds are fully, fully upgraded. Right? Maximum heart bond, level 9 on the toughness and strength bond, and so on. Which I've pretty much done, I think, for every single tank I had. Okay. Bernhardt is here, right? Landis is here with also 96%. Juggler is lower, but the only reason he's lower is because I didn't bother to max out his strength bond. Juggler is not based on strength. His attack value always gets replaced, so the way I didn't need to upgrade his strength bond, so I left it alone. So, let's now talk about my Bernhardt's gear. Now, in terms of gear, when I used them for the finals, I had replaced the speed boots with Leon's Overlord's badge. So he had more attack and defense here, and the hit point increase, attack increase, and all stats increase. So the main key though was that he got the immunity to defense, de match defense reduction, attack and defense reduction, and mobility reduction. Other than that gear, you know, Bernhard is running full moon, which allowed for the swap very smoothly because Leon also runs full moon. Other than that, he had a carbon fiber helmet, which had a 10% defense increase, 10% magic defense increase, and a 7% hit point increase. He also had a carbon fiber armor that provided 11% hit points, 6% magic defense, and 181 hit points. So you can see I've really focused on survivability on both of these items. Finally, his balance blade gave 13% attack, 6% hit point increase. So overall, he was quite tanky, uh, despite being 5 stars. I really do wish mine was 6 stars, but I can't complain about this overall. You know, Especially when, for the first attack anyways, he, his carbon fiber armor and helmet provided a 16% defense and match defense increase. right? On top, and, and then full moon provides a 10% all stats increase and so on. So... That was why my Bernhardt had something like, I think, 700 plus defense, even though he's only a 5-star hero. Next, Luna. Now, I really don't know if Luna changing her to a Pegasus Master was a good idea for the finals. I did it more as a surprise weapon, because a lot of people saw me using a bow Luna previously. So... Don't know if it paid off or not though. Uh, she does have level 10 Holy Pegasus Soldiers, and the Veil of Light gave 3% hit points of 10% magic defense increase. Twilight Armor, 12% magic defense increase, some defense. Twilight, oh sorry, that was the Twilight Helmet. Twilight Armor, 11% hit points, 10% magic defense with a 5 magic defense increase. And finally, the Cursed Lance had a 5% magic defense increase with 2 magic defense and another 2% hit points. So, Really, I focus much more on magic defense overall than anything else. Uh, although I am missing 3% here and 5% here. She never really got to play a role in the finals at all. She was usually banned. And the one battle where I got to play her, which was against Suwin, she never actually got to attack. So. Continuing on. So, after Luna is Listelle. And my Listelle never got to play a role either. She was always banned, but she has near perfect gear for her. Oath of Justice with a magic defense and hit point increase. Galaxy Cloak, hit point increase and magic defense increase. The George's uh, Feathered Helm, 15% hit point increase. I really, really wish this was an 8% magic defense increase, but it wasn't. And then finally, Swordsmith Metal with hit point increase, hit point increase, and magic defense increase. So, not much else to say. You, know, you, can, you can always re-roll these enchants on her because she really does... The more magic defense and hit points she has, the better she is. But these are pretty solid rolls so far. After Listel... Oh, Listel's spawns is also pretty much maxed out. The only one I didn't touch is her 
strength bond as usual, because her intelligence in the first place is based on her magic defense. So there's, once again, no reason to upgrade this strength bond unless you desperately need the skill increases. Next was Rene. And Rene, I'll talk about her bonds first before talking about her in detail. Rene's bonds are also maxed out, 96%. And the reason I maxed out her bonds first is because my Rene in truth is at a terrible star level. Don't think I've really got to use her much, but she is actually four stars. That's it. Four stars, not even five. But despite that, her power level is actually 6283 because she does have a decent amount of hit points. She has surprisingly high hit points in intelligence. She ran a Holy Ring, 9% int, 2% hit point increase, a Dark Crown with some int increase and some hit point increase. Uh, dark Crowns are okay because they give some hit point increase right there. You know. Once again, it's these Dark Crowns tend to be a temporary measure until you can get a lot of Yajasil Reefs or Tenyo's Headdresses. So as a temporary measure, they're great pieces of equipment. She did have a Tenyo's Robe with an 11% hit point increase. So this is a 21% hit point increase right there. And then finally, she ran an Astaroth with 11% hit point increase and 11 per int, which is, I think, roughly equal to, let's say, 30% int increase. Once again, something that could be re-rolled, but not enough scrolls, so it never was. For her role, for me, which was mainly to toss up AoEs, Calamity Throw and Decay, this is more than enough setup. You know, once again, as with all my mages, generally mages and healers, I generally focus on hit point increases, or even over intelligence. But uh, yeah, so that was Renee. Four stars. She actually did help me a lot in getting to Langrisser rank, even though she was four stars because. Enemies constantly do not expect a DK attack. They don't expect a Calamity Throw to apply cannot be healed on them. And they also don't expect her wide variety of single target strike skills, whether it's Freeze Strike or Fireball or Wind Blade. You know, she can even use Shadow Spear against Holy Units, which is probably the worst choice. But the fact that she has these other three is incredibly useful and versatile. The only lack in truth is she's not very good against Lendius. But against Landius, I generally ended up tossing out AoEs. Her enchant was clocks, so she could hopefully keep tossing out AoEs. And if she keeps applying cannot be healed on a Landius, eventually the Landius is going to get slaughtered. That was my basic plan when I used Rene against Landius. Otherwise, she could use a combination of AoEs and single target strikes. Worked out very well for me. Although, as I said, I don't think she ever made an appearance in the playoffs. Next, Landius. 5 stars, max bonds, and his gear was covered previously. I have not changed his gear for quite some time. Dragon Slayer weapon with 12% attack and 4% hit points. Comboed with the 8% attack and hit point increase, it made him reasonably tanky. Mirror armor, 10% defense, 5% hit points, thorns enchant, you know. Mirror Armor could have used a reroll, but I don't have any real Thorns enchant scrolls. So I actually did try rerolling this several times, but just did not get anything better. Aeneas' Helmet. 15% defense, 6% hit points, 5 defense, and an additional 10% hit points and 5% defense here. You know, just a great roll. The only thing that could have been better was probably if we changed the values. So it was 15% hit points and 6% defense, but I'll take it. Overlord's Badge, 8% attack, 15 hit points, 3% magic defense, meh. Could be rerolled. like I said, lack of scrolls. And you know what, Landius was very tanky for me in general, he played his role, I have no complaints about him. The only complaint if I would, would be that I need to make him 6 stars. Elwyn, who didn't show up in any of my playoff fights, but was occasionally brought, ran a Peacemaker with Breeze Enchant. The roll on it was kind of weird, 9% attack with 17 attack. 
right? Given hit, so that was basically a 3% attack increase. You can say this is 12% attack with 3% hit points. Once again, lack of scrolls. Yeah. And what I felt was my Elwyn was doing enough damage to one-shot targets in general, so I didn't need to roll re-roll this. And then his armor, 3% attack, 15% defense, 4% magic defense. Not a very good enchant for PvP, although a very good one for PvE. Chief's Helmet, I did re-roll this a few times and ended up with 11% magic defense, 11% defense and 5% hit point in Q roll. Once again, this is a very good PvE enchant, not a great one for PvP, but I no longer had any scrolls to roll any further. In truth, if I got this roll on someone like Juggler, I would be screaming in joy, but instead I got it on Elwyn. Finally, he has a Slayer's Emblem with a 9% attack increase and 26 hit point increase. So you can see, he doesn't really have any hit point increases, which was a huge detriment to my Elwyn. But he also made very few appearances, and when he did make an appearance, it would be to, let's say, one-shot Landius and so on. But over time, I ended up replacing my Elwyn with AoE attackers, such as Rene and Imelda. Juggler! What is there to say? Juggler is a monster. He doesn't have his final gear. This Throne Guardian really should be replaced with uh, Oath of Justice. So that's something I'm looking into. Um, haven't done it yet though. Similarly, this Gargoyle Jacket needs to be replaced with the Last Rites. But I haven't done that either because I don't have enough last rates. The juggler exclusive though, I have been rerolling the enchants on, and currently it has a 15% hit point increase with 5% magic defense. I'll probably keep rerolling this, hoping to get something better, because remember, theoretically you can get a hit point percentage increase, magic defense increase, and defense increase. That would be the absolute ideal, but uh, yeah, good luck rolling for something like that. Finally, his Overlord's Badge increases defense and hit points, which is solid. 7% each, right? It's a max of 10% each, so I'm reasonably happy with this enchant. So overall, he has pretty solid enchants. The only thing that I really need to improve is replace the Throne Guardian and replace the Gargoyle Jacket when I get uh, another Oath of Justice and another Last Rites, respectively. The irony here is I actually had three Oath of Justices at one point, I didn't realize you actually needed three, and I have actually fed one of the Oath of Justices into another one, so I do regret that. Uh, yeah, when I upgraded Listel's Oath of Justice, I had fed it one of my other oaths. So, oh well, it is what it is. Next, two characters left to cover. Lana has a Blue Moon, 15% int, and 30 hit points. Lena, my priority for her was to be able to tank some AoEs if possible. So she does ha currently have a Tenyo's Robe with a 10% hit point increase for 20% hit points. She also has an Odin's Battle Helmet with 9% hit point increase and 3% int. And finally, a Holy Ring with a 9% int increase. It's actually not as high as I thought it would be, but generally speaking, uh, my Lana was surprisingly hard to AoE down in two hits by, let's say, although there were situations where she did die. For example, I know my Lana died before to two AoE hits from Leonhard, right? So, but it is what it is. Yeah. Huge number of these things are limitations based on how many scrolls and how much gold you have. And last but not least is Bozol. And Bozol is in an interesting spot because, for example, his Galaxy Cloak currently has a really, really good enchant with 13% magic defense and 7% hit point increase. Clocks. With clocks, right? I really originally planned to replace that Galaxy Cloak with, Imeld with the uh, Baldur's White Robe. But... With such a good enchant on Bozol's Galaxy Cloak right now, it makes it very hard for me to replace. Unless I roll something similar on the Baldur's Right Robe. And would it have to be something like 
once again, you know, 13 to 15% magic defense hit point increase with another hit point increase. That's not easy to roll for. So... Until I have a lot of scrolls, that transition isn't going to happen. She does have He does have a Miracle Staff with 3% hit points increase and 5% magic defense. A Dark Crown with 14% magic defense increase, the 10% here stacks, and then, then a decent amount of hit points increase. And then finally a Speed Boot with a 6% magic defense hit point, 6% magic defense and 4% hit points. Do I need to re-roll these enchants? I honestly don't feel that I have to, because his AoE Blast already hit ridiculously hard. You know? Yes, if I was aiming for absolute perfection, I would probably re-roll this, but as it is, I'm quite satisfied with my Bozo's performance. He has enough hit points to tank hits, he has enough damage to do AoE strikes. Haven't seen the need to go for perfection yet. No, that may change in Season 2. And there we are. My, I guess, 17 characters that I currently use for Apex Arena. There are a few other sets of gear, for example, Leon's set of gear that I didn't really bother to going over. Um, Ledin's set of gear, which hasn't changed. He does have an Oath of Justice, and I've been considering giving that Oath of Justice to Juggler. But we'll see what happens, right? Because it may be possible I pick up another Oath soon. And if I do, I don't want to have to, you know, re it would have been a waste to reroll the enchant on this one to give to Juggler. Ledin's gear though has not changed for a long time. He's been using this for <laughs> for months now. Other than these two sets, I do also have a set of gear currently on Shafaniel that is being built up. Uh, it's a level 50 blue moon with some hit point increase and 13% int. There is a black bride which is eventually going to go on Lena. There is her exclusive with 15% hit point increase and a 4 int increase and another 92 hit points. And then finally, she, had, she currently has a star earring with 7% int and 2 magic defense. She just hasn't made it into my party yet because A, she is currently 5 stars and B, she doesn't have double class mastery just yet. But I think Shafaniel is going to join my party for season 2. Narm also actually has a set of gear that's nearly fully built up in C. Windcutter Dagger, level 50. 27 attack increase and a 5% attack increase. She has a Monkey King's Fest, 3% attack, 6% hit points, and another 4 attack. Currently a Twilight Helmet. I use these helmets as transi transitional equipment until I get uh, Chief's Helmets for all my characters. This one just has a full hit point increase buff. And then she also has a Lone Star Amulet with, or Lone Star Armlet with a 10% attack increase. Shuri has a mixed set of gear. Um, it's kind of like leftovers from the past. You know, a last night, you know, a twilight armor that's currently level 41 out of 50. A gargoyle jacket that would sorry a gar oh, sorry a Loki's mask that has a pretty crappy enchanting truth and it's just sitting here with a clocks enchant. Don't ask me why she it has a clocks enchant. And then finally a judge's talisman with a breeze enchant with 7% attack increase and 10% crit. Yes, a, it, the, as I said, these are more like leftover pieces of gear that I haven't found a use for yet. Similarly, uh, Sonya has a set kind of like that too. There's a level 50 seal guardian, which, you know, they my seal guardians have been getting replaced by other items, right? You know, Leonhard, for example, has a bloodthirster, uh, and then Bernhard has a balanced blade. So I do have a few more seal guardians that are just sitting in place right now. Sonya has one of them. She has an Aeneas' armor that's actually level 30, hoping to get a few more. She has a Reaper's helm at level 50 that has not been assigned to anyone. It has a pretty good enchant with 8% hit points and 3% attack. And it's a full moon enchant, so we'll see what I do with that. And then finally, she has a Wing Shin Guard that's only level 30, aiming for a rough sea enchant. So a broken set as usual. Two rough seas, two full moons. I've already I've talked about Sophia's gear, and it's a minimal effort. I guess minimal cost set of gear. 
on Sophia, so I won't really go over that. Jessica, surprisingly, has several pieces of equipment on her. There's a level 40 goddess's left hand that I'm slowly building up. There is a Sharon at level 40 that I'm also slowly building up. And there is a drop near that's level 50. So you can see I do have a lot of additional pieces of items that are just waiting for me to figure out what to who to put them on. For example, maybe I'll build up a Rachel for a PvP and give her some of these items. Alte Muller currently has a level 20 Ragnarok and a level 20 exclusive for him. Um, Ragnarok is one of those items that I'm going to slowly build up for Season 2. Hein has a spare Miracle Staff that needs upgrading. And is there anything else? I think I've pretty much covered everything. I mean, there's a, there are still a few additional pieces of items sitting here and there. For example, you can see here, I have another level 50 Lone Star armlet that no one has equipped. Uh, that had the magic enchant, which used to be on Leonhard. That was a temporary measure. So there are still a few odd pieces of gear here and there, but on the whole, nothing complete other than that. So there we go. Gear-wise, I'm pretty set. You know, I do have a teddy bear that I need to level up to level 50 in preparation for Ancient's Call. That's one of the pieces I'm absolutely building up. And I do have also three Kagekidan uniforms, which I will likely build up because they're actually pretty good items. Uh, what they do is before being forced into battle from ranked attack, they deal fixed damage to the enemy, which is 0 0.5 times hero's magic defense. The damage isn't high, the whole point of it, in truth, is to do fixed damage to the enemy attacker so that their sorceress soldiers won't have the additional 45% attack increase on them. That is the main use of Kagekidan uniform. And it can definitely save you from getting one-shotted. So... Other than that, you know, um, there's just items that I haven't really been willing to break apart yet, like a level, like an arcane battle garb, um, clothesline poles, because I had one, two, three, four of them, so I could make a level 50 right here once I have enough gold, a Vidar's rose, a soul stealer headdress, because the chant having another character who can potentially silence enemies is always useful. Yeah. This is another level 50 carbon fiber helmet if I ever upgrade it. Uh, it just, once again, it depends on what enemies I run into in general, right? And yeah. Oh, and then there is a new Aeolus's battle armor. Although I do prefer Bloodline Limit Magic Armors, and Aeolus is, is not bad to have. And there's also a Yadrasil Branch. And yeah. And finally, a level 40 Angel's Feather. And also, enough Holy Arcs to make a level 50. Oh, wow, I completely forgot, but I also did pick up a Goddess tier in the past. So you can see I have a lot of items sitting in reserve that I could build up and I will be building up over time. So right now for sure I think the items of priority would probably be the goddess tier as well as the teddy bear because my current preparation is for Ancient's Call. And yeah, this was a long video but I've covered all my equipment and Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you found this kind of interesting and useful. Uh, at the very least, it gives you a good sense of what kind of equipment even a free-to-play can have for PvP. You can see that I used a lot of temporary stopgap measures pieces of items. You know, dark crowns, you know, twilight armors, all of those things. And all of those things were simply built up by collecting multiple copies of these items. 
I didn't use any epic martial spirits to upgrade these items. It's just over time, you know, you get four of those, uh, you get, let's say, four of those Anasis armors and you have a level 51. You get four peacemakers, you have a level 51. Uh, items that I would upgrade, though, would be things like the Agisil Reef, Tenyo's Robe, Blue Moons, Holy Rings, and so on. So, yeah. Thanks for watching. And on that note, Nitro out.